Good morning, and welcome from what's hopefully by now less smoky California. I'm really excited to present the next round of the RAND Hospital Price Transparency Project. This is something that we initially planned on presenting in May, but just given all that's happened since then, decided to push it back until today. Since we last spoke about 18 months ago, we've made lots of progress on issues that I think are really important for employers. And so I think the results that we're going to present today are things that employers can hopefully take lots of value from. Before going into the study, I just want to make a few acknowledgements. So first, this study was funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and also by several participating employers that contribute to the study. We really wouldn't be here today without the, the study conceptualization from the Employers Forum in Indiana. So this is something that really grew out of, of EFI, and so I'm really excited to be back at EFI virtually to present our results. And then finally, I had the, the opportunity to work with a really great study team at RAND. And so if you are one of the employers or health plans who have, have participated in the study and uh, worked with us, I'm sure you've interacted with some of our team members. And so just as kind of us as a team, uh, what really kind of motivates us to think about hospital prices and the employer role for thinking for hospital prices is just really the, the size of this market. In the United States, employers, many of you in the room, provide health insurance for about half of Americans. Collectively, you spend about $1.2 trillion in healthcare costs and hospitals are the kind of the largest source of that spending and account for just under $500 billion from the private market in 2018. If we look at the prices that you as employers are paying, they're increasing relatively rapidly relative to Medicare and, and Medicaid prices. So this study, this, this chart uses data from Medicare cost reports and just looks at how, how the case mix adjusted discharge costs for private insurers has compared to Medicare and Medicaid insurers over the last couple of years. Now, prices for, for everyone have gone up over the, the last couple of years, but prices have gone up by far the most for, for private insurers. Now, we, we might say that the prices go up in lots of markets, but I think that this is especially important for, for healthcare. If you're an employer, you pay for wages in, or you pay for healthcare rather, out of wages and other benefits. And it's important, I think, to look at a kind of national perspective on how workers are now getting paid. This, this charts from a, a recent paper uh, for, for another project where we actually looked at how wages and, and healthcare costs have grown for the employer market over the last decade. If you look at the blue line, you can see that inflation adjusted wages for the average worker have actually remained flat over the last decade. And of course, this doesn't include any uh, potential wage reductions due to COVID. If you look at the, the red line, you can see that health insurance costs, and this is the for the employer-sponsored market, have actually increased pretty steadily. And so there's a growing concern that rising healthcare costs are eating into wages. And as, as we're thinking about what's the kind of real policy motivation here, we want to make sure that workers continue to be paid in, in wage costs that they can take home and, and pay rent and, and uh, spend on uh, instead of just purely healthcare dollars. And so if we look at kind of what we know versus don't know, we do know that private healthcare plans are, are prices are, are going higher and faster than Medicare. So that was illustrated in the, the previous report. There have been several other studies that have found that increases in spending are really driven by, by price growth and not necessarily utilization differences. And there's also a, a kind of growing uh, recognition that prices vary widely from market to market and also from hospital to hospital, even within the same market. Well, there's some things that we do know. There's also a lot that we do not know. 
So one is how do prices compare across the country? And so if we just know that, that prices are, are growing for private insurance plans in general, it's really hard to design smart policies that address specific areas of high cost growth. At the same time, it's also really hard to learn from areas that have experienced less price growth if we don't know exactly what prices look like across the country. We do know some evidence that, that hospital prices are continuing to rise, but how has that actually looked over the, the last couple of years? In addition, what hospitals and health systems are actually getting paid the highest price and at the same time, which hospitals are getting paid or lower prices and might be, be areas where, where we can potentially direct patient volume. And then finally, I, I think the, the most important part is actually for, for you as, as employers, what are the prices that you are paying and are these prices in line with the value that you think you're getting? And I, I think this is an important question, not just for kind of a, a research type question, but I think you as, as employers actually have a responsibility for, for understanding prices. So if you look at uh, how the, the Department of Labor defines fiduciary responsibility, the Department of Labor states that fiduciaries have a responsibility to act solely in the interest of plan participants and their beneficiaries with the exclusive purpose of providing benefits to them. And so if you're a self-insured employer, by definition, you are a fiduciary to your employees when you, you fund your, your health plan. And a question that, that uh, frequently comes up is, is I've talked to employers, is how can you be a, a appropriate fiduciary and fulfill these obligations without knowing prices? And so if you think about how employers purchase anything across the organization, the question of how much is it going to cost us is a key question. But for, for healthcare, we've kind of thrown that same business logic out the window. And I think with better transparency, we can actually enable employers to apply that same type of logic, how they, how they run their organization, to healthcare. And I just also want to acknowledge that we're in a, a particularly challenging time. And the COVID pandemic is placing an enormous financial burden on both hospitals and employers. We know that hospitals and other health professionals are important and critical member of virtually every community. But at the same time, health benefits are one of the largest expenses for employers. And while hospitals are facing financial troubles due to reductions in revenue for, from patients cutting back care, there are also many employers, and I'm sure many on the line today, that are facing incredibly challenging questions and perhaps the, the most challenging questions that they'll face in their career related to, to not giving workers a pay raise, potentially laying off workers, and maybe not even being able to make it. And so I think now more than ever, it's important that employers have transparent information on hospital prices. And I just want to expand on that a little bit. So when we're thinking about kind of the, the goals of the study, I think it's really critical to keep in mind that me as a, as a researcher or you know any other uh, uh, researcher really doesn't know what the right price for healthcare could be, should be. I, I can't tell an employer how much they should pay wages. Uh, I can't tell them how much they should pay for travel and so on. But what I can do and we can do and try to do in this this report is give them the information that allows employers to make the, those types of decisions. And so what we really want to do is enable employers to use this type of information and take that with knowledge about their own employee populations and markets to think about the prices that are being negotiated on their behalf. And so the, the RAND uh, hospital studies has been a, a bit of a journey. And so we're actually on our third round. And so just to, to illustrate you know, where we started and what's been added in over the, the last couple of rounds, this study started in what we call phase one or RAND 1.0, which is just 
employers within Indiana. Uh, it only looked at employers, no, no health plans, uh, no sources of uh, outside data. We just looked at facility fees and prices relative to Medicare. And the results we shared with you about 18 months ago, ran 2.0, we used data from 25 different states. We were able to get data from, again, employers, also add in a couple of health plans and include two state-run all-payer claims databases. We expanded the study to look at inpatient and outpatient services. We just looked at facility fees again to, to focus on, on kind of the largest uh, source of, of hospital spending. And one thing we did add in last year, in addition to relative prices, were standardized prices. Now I'm gonna explain the two prices in a couple of minutes. For, for this study, we looked at data from 49 different states. We had some data from Maryland, but Maryland actually has a, a unique program where a given hospital receives the same reimbursement amount from Medicare and private insurers. And so we just made our lives easier by, by not including Maryland in the study. We continued to get data from employers and health plans and got data from four additional all-payer claims databases. We again focused on inpatient and outpatient services but we're able to add in professional fees. And so if you go to the, the hospital and you, you get a bill from, from the facility and so that covers running the hospital, but then there's also a professional component that comes from, from the providers that, that deliver the care. And we combine those two to get maybe a, a, what we think is a more comprehensive measure of, of prices. In addition to just the, the overall uh, prices, we also looked at service line prices. And so we, we got all this data and, and we really tried to think about what's the, what's the best way to, to use it. So we, we uh, with the support of EFI and also several other employer coalitions, went out and, and uh, uh, met with employers and, and were able to get data. We got data, as I said earlier, from several all-payer claims databases and, and health plans. And in this study, we measure prices in two ways. So one is a, a relative price to, to benchmark uh, or a relative price uh, that's relative to Medicare. And so this is our, our, our relative price and also a price per case mix weight, which we call the standardized price. We created a public hospital price transparency report this is the report that we were actually able to, to, to release this morning. Uh, it's freely uh, downloadable on, and online, and you can just go to the, the RAND website and, and look at it yourselves. And for the study, we, we, as I said earlier, look at inpatient outpatient prices, and then also have supplemental data that looks at uh, or names specific hospitals uh, and, and health systems. And then for the participating employers, we, we created uh, what we term the private reports. And so this, this is data that's maybe a little bit more actionable for an employer. So instead of knowing what kind of prices look from this nationwide sample population, maybe you care about the prices that you're paying as an employer. And so for the private reports, we just use the, the data that employers contributed and said among your population, this is what prices look like. So just to, to go into a little bit more detail on how we, we think about the, the true price measures, uh, this is something that you know, is conceptually a, a little bit of, of a challenge, really because hospitals are all different. They all do different things and see different types of patients. And so what we're gonna rely on here is the, the Medicare system to make more what we call an apples to apples comparison. And so we, we kind of have a little bit of fun with it. And so we say, we're gonna make an apple pie, but have two different recipes. So our, our first approach is, and this is the one that we kind of rely on as the, the, the main uh, uh, approach is what we call percent of Medicare. And so what this essentially is, is what do employers pay relative to what Medicare would have paid at the exact same hospital for the exact same set of services? I personally like this, this approach because it's really easy to interpret and it's really easy to just have a single number that compares across hospitals. 
this number is also, I, I think, uh, nice because Medicare adjusts for a lot of different characteristics. So, uh, for example, cost of living and, and wage differences, which all uh, are things that, that might lead to differences in prices. Our second approach is what we call the, the standardized approach. And this, this approach also uses the Medicare system, but instead of saying how much would have Medicare paid for the exact same system, we look at the relative differences across, across patient mix and procedures and try and, and replicate that same difference. And so just for, for example, the, the Medicare system has figured out that it costs almost 35 times more to treat a patient who gets a heart transplant surgery than a patient who just shows at the hospital for chest pains. And so in, in our data, we still we see patients who get heart transplant surgeries and patients who, who have chest pains, and we use the same relative price differential to have an apples to apples comparison among those two patients. And the way I kind of like to think of, about this price is it's the, the average uh, walk out the door price and everything is a, a single dollar amount. The other advantage of this, this uh, uh, approach is Medicare bakes into, uh, or Medicare uses rather, different payment uh, methodologies for, for teaching hospitals, hospitals with a, a large share of disproportionate patients, uh, and other uh, uh, characteristics that can lead to, to differences in Medicare prices. Now, some in, employers may want to account for those types of, of structural differences in their payments, but some may not. And so for employers who, who just want to uh, pay for, for what they get and not worry about these other types of characteristics, this maybe provides a, a better comparison. And, and finally, to, to be clear about our comparison to Medicare, we are using the Medicare system as a price benchmark and, and not a price endpoint. So another way to think of that is we're saying how much are employers paying relative to Medicare, not necessarily what they should be paying relative to Medicare, and certainly not that they should be paying the exact same amount as what Medicare pays. And we, we think that this is a uh, an appropriate benchmark in comparison to make because the Medicare system develops prices and been doing so over, over several, several decades in ways that are empirically based and, and transparent and also involve lots of input from industry and other types of stakeholders uh, and, are, and are things that uh, we, we can actually monitor and have good insight on. And another way to think of this is that benchmarking relative to Medicare also allows medi employers rather to compare prices between hospitals relative to what they look like across different hospitals, but then also relative to the largest purchaser of healthcare benefits in the world. <clears throat> a, a question that, that's come up from, from several other employers are, are questions around data, data co confidentiality and, and data protections. And so this study was regulated by the RAND Human Subjects Protection Committee, and it was all the analyses were done on a, a secure computing environment, which is actually similar to, to the, or actually is the same environment rather, that RAND uses to look at other uh, medical claims data, including Medicare data. Everyone who touches the data undergoes HIPAA and human subjects uh, training. And then we've also entered into a pretty extensive set of data use agreements and, and uh, non-disclosure agreements to protect data confidentiality. All right, so on to, to what we actually found. So I, I think the, uh, the finding that is, is the high level finding and maybe the finding that gets the most interest is that we documented a pretty wide variation in hospital prices. Uh, and so uh, when we look at how much employers and private health insurers are paying relative to Medicare, the, the gap between employer plans and, and Medicare has increased year over year. So in 2016, employers were paying 224% of, of what Medicare pays. In 2017, that increased to 230% of what Medicare pays. And in 2018, employers and, and private payers were paying prices that were 247% of what Medicare pays. And so just to be clear, 
this difference accounts for the, the general price trends in, in growth and reimbursement rates in the Medicare system. And so it's above and beyond those inflationary system uh, adjustments that Medicare makes. We also found that prices relative to Medicare that employers and private plans are paying vary pretty considerably across states. So if we look at uh, states like Arkansas, we found that employers were paying actually uh, less than 200% of Medicare on average, compared to states like Virginia, where employers were paying prices that were above 325% of Medicare. And then the thing to note is that for a given state, we found a pretty uh, wide gap or at least variation in the gap between what that, uh, the inpatient and outpatient prices within that state. Now, this, this uh, chart and the, the, the chart in the previous slide combine professional fees and facility fees to have a uh, comprehensive view of, of prices within a given state, rather than within a given hospital. But when we break the two out, we actually find pretty wide variation. So for example, if we just look at, at facility fees, we find that relative to, to what Medicare pays, Indiana has among the highest hospital facility fees at over 300% of Medicare. But if we look at professional fees, and so this is how much physicians and other health professionals get reimbursed, Indiana is actually uh, at the bottom, uh, or close to the bottom rather, at about 130% of, of Medicare. And if we combine the two and look at the gap between what facilities and professionals are, are, are getting relative to Medicare, we find that there's a, also a wide variation. And so if we look at the gap between professional fees and facility fees, we find that there's some states, for example, Minnesota, where the relative professional fee is higher than the facility fee. On the other end, there are some states like West Virginia and uh, Indiana, where the facility fee is substantially higher than the professional fee. So in Indiana, for example, the gap between the facility fee and the professional fee is roughly 200% of Medicare. So I've documented in the study, we've documented that there's wide variation in prices across states, but we also found that within a given state, there's considerable variation. And so this plot shows the 25th percentile, the median, and the 75th percentile within a given state. What we find is that in addition to variation in prices, in, in median prices and mean prices, which is the, the middle dash, the, within a given state, there's actually more variation within that state than if you were just to compare mean prices across states. And so I think that this chart is actually, uh, uh, suggests rather that there are potential options and, and policy options for employers and other insurers if they think about where they fall in that distribution. So if you're paying prices that are towards the upper end of that distribution, then that really suggests that there's perhaps something you could do to shift demand towards lower price providers. At the same time, if you're a provider or if you're uh, a bulk of your patients go to providers, the, the lower end of the distribution, uh, so those at the, the 25th percent are at the bottom, then that suggests that maybe you're getting good prices or at least going to providers that have low prices. We also found that within a, a given hospital system, there is, is also wide variation in prices. And so this chart shows something similar for hospital systems in our, our data that have at least 10 or more hospitals. What we find 
is that with similar to what we found in states, there, there are many hospital systems where the gap between the 25th and the 75th percentile hospital is over several hundred percentage points relative to Medicare. And so what this also really suggests that it's important to think about what are the, the hospital, uh, uh, individual hospitals rather within a system that are within an employer's network. Looking at, at quality is critical. And so if all the higher priced hospitals are high quality, <clears throat> then we may actually be, be benefiting from higher prices and it actually may be a, a worthwhile deal. On the other hand, if there's a, a mix between high price and low price providers uh, and also quality ratings, then, then it really suggests that we need to think about both price and quality when thinking about what's a good value. And so just to illustrate that, the, this slide shows the relationship between provider price. And so for this, we've bucketed provider prices in three different categories relative to Medicare. So we have what we call the low price providers. These are, are hospitals with prices that are uh, one and a half times or below Medicare. The medium price hospitals, which are those between one and a half and two and a half times of Medicare and the higher price hospitals, which are those that are above two and a half times of Medicare or 250%. To look at quality, we used data from the, the Medicare hospital star system. And so the, the graph on the left shows among those three different hospital price buckets, what's the share of hospitals that have five quality stars. And so this is the, the highest rating you can get, four stars, three stars, two stars or one star, which is actually the, the lowest. We've repeated the, the similar exercise using safety score data from the, the LeapFrog group. And so you can see the, the number of hospitals or rather the share of hospitals that have a grade of A, which is the highest, B, C, D, or F. Now, important takeaway here is that that most hospitals have actually pretty good quality. And so especially if we look at the leapfrog scores, the, the set of hospitals that have either A or B grades is actually pretty high. If we use either the, the CMS ratings or the, the leapfrog ratings, there are actually a, a relatively small share of hospitals that have the lowest quality grade. And so we, we do, if we, we look at this, we do actually find a, a slight relationship between price and quality with higher priced hospitals having slightly higher quality. But there are many hospitals that have high quality and low prices, and likewise hospitals that are, are um, high priced and, and low quality. And so I think if, if employers are thinking about actually uh, 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 taking this data to, to a planned network, it's critical that they think about both price and quality. So another finding that we, we got from the study is, is the relationship between patient discharges and the share of a, of a hospital's volume that comes from public payers and that hospital's price. And so a, a common argument for why some hospitals are more expensive than other hospitals is that those hospitals treat a large share of Medicaid or Medicare patients. And so we actually put that hypothesis to the test a little bit. And so if, if uh, that theory, which is commonly referred to as the cost shift theory, is true, then we should see that hospitals that have lots of Medicare and Medicaid patients are the ones that have high prices, and hospitals that have fewer Medicaid or Medicare prices actually have lower prices. And so what we actually found when we looked at the data was it, it really is, is no pattern between a hospital's share of patients that, that are either on, on Medicare or Medicaid and the, the patient or the, that hospital's price. And so while, while it's true that Medicare and Medicaid do reimburse hospitals at a lower rate than, than private payers, and, and we in fact document that in, the study, in our study, it doesn't look like that differences actually explains why, why there are differences in hospital prices. Okay. 
And so while I have a, a, a bunch of Indiana employers, I wanted to talk specifically about some prices uh, that we found from Indiana. And and I, I know this is a, a national conference, so I, I don't want to give too much attention to Indiana. But I wanted this to, to more illustrate how employers and other policymakers can use some of the supplemental data that we reported. And so on the, the RAND website, we have a, an Excel file that anyone can download that actually has specific uh, or prices by specific hospitals, health systems, and within given states. And so for this, this study, or the, these slides rather, I use data from what we reported uh, in Indiana. And so to, uh, what we found, if we look at the variation in hospital system prices, we find that if we look at the pooled inpatient and outpatient, and also combine facility versus professional fees. The hospitals in, uh, or system prices rather in Indiana, range from an average of 166% of Medicare for independent hospitals. If we look at systems, the, the lowest price system is LifePoint Health at 168% of Medicare. And if we look at the, the more expensive hospitals, the system that's at the upper end is Parkview Health at 387% of Medicare. And so the, what we've also done is add in uh, uh, prices for, for just inpatient and outpatient services. And so if we look at here at just inpatient services specifically, We've done that the same ranking or same tabulation of hospital prices for inpatient services. And so the blue columns show inpatient uh, or, or relative prices rather. The bars on the left hand side show the, the relative percent of Medicare. And then I also mentioned earlier that we had a second measure, price measure of standardized prices. And so here you can see the, the dollar amount of standardized prices in red. And what we find here is if we just look at inpatient uh, services, the independent hospitals are just over 100% Medicare and have an average standardized price for inpatient services of about $15,000. If we look at the other end, we find that the Parkview Health System and Indiana U University Health have the, the highest relative prices uh, relative to Medicare at around 300% of Medicare. But it's important to note that we, we actually find slightly different rankings when we look at the standardized price. And so actually the uh, uh, there is a gap in the standardized price if we were just to look at these two hospitals. And I think the uh, way, way to, to to think about that is that Indiana University Health does lots of other activities that might influence its Medicare rate that Parkview Health System may not do. And so I think when employers are thinking about using this data, it's important to think about how much they value those other things that, that Medicare does and also to, to look at the inpatient or the uh, standardized versus relative prices as well. When we look at the, the same set of services for, for outpatient services, we find that on average outpatient services are a little bit higher relative to Medicare. And so for outpatient services, our, our bottom is, uh, 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 at least relative to Medicare, is Baptist Healthcare System, which is just under 200% of Medicare. And the upper end is Parkview Health System, which is a little over 400% of Medicare. And if we look at the standardized prices, we can see that the, the prices are quite a bit higher, about an order of magnitude lower, sorry, quite a bit lower uh, in an order of magnitude lower than prices, these standardized prices for inpatient services. And so I, I think that the takeaway from these handful of slides is that there is a, a wide variation in, in prices within the, the, uh, the state of Indiana and how employers think about navigating those, that, that landscape, I think is an important question for, for employers as they're designing the benefits and working with their TPAs.
And so th those uh, figures give the, the high level overview of how prices compare across different health systems and across different states. But as I mentioned earlier, additional thing that we did is look at how prices vary within uh, given procedures. And so just to, to illustrate that, this chart shows something similar for uh, inpatient orthopedic surgeries, where we find that the, the standardized price for inpatient orthopedic surgery ranges from a low of about uh, $7,000 all the way up to about $35,000. And so if employers are thinking about say uh, bundled networks or targeted referral patterns for specific services, then these types of, of results might be important to consider. So I, I said earlier, I wanted to share some results for, for states outside of Indiana. This chart actually looks at all the hospitals in our system. Uh, there's too many to, to name here. And so each, each individual line is a specific hospital. And so across the country, we see similar levels of, of variation in, in hospital prices uh, that we observed in Indiana. And so employers in, in any market can use this type of information to think about the price that they're paying and to potentially think about potential innovations. And just to re repeat the exercise for, for a few other services, for labor and delivery, we find that in Indiana, prices range from about $5,000 at the low end all the way up to just 30, under $30,000. And if we look across the country, we find again, uh, similar patterns where at the low end uh, prices are about uh, five, five to $7,000 and range all the way up to a high of around $52,000. And then two uh, procedures that, that I wanted to highlight, just because while we don't have data on, on COVID, these two types of procedures I, I think are, are relevant for, for the potential cost of, of COVID. So if we just look at inpatient services for circulatory procedures in the state of Indiana, we find that relative prices range from about 150% of Medicare to over 400% of Medicare. And the standardized price, if we look at these uh, in, in the, the dollar amounts and not relative to Medicare, range from about $12,000 to just under 40, or just over $40,000. And as we, we look across the country, we again see similar levels of, of price variation uh, for inpatient circulatory procedures at all hospitals in our study sample. And then finally, for the, the last inpatient procedure that uh, I'm going to highlight today, which is also, I think, relevant for COVID respiratory conditions. And so this is people who get treated with a specific respiratory condition. This is, again, pre-COVID, but potentially informative for how employers are thinking about the cost of COVID. For inpatient circulatory procedures in the state of Indiana, we find that prices range from about 200% of Medicare all the way up to just under 400% of Medicare and that standardized prices range from about $17,000 up to, to just under $40,000. And so within uh, uh, inpatient respiratory procedures, there's maybe less variation in prices than we saw for, for the other procedures, but there is still some, some variation across hospitals and health systems. And so I, I also mentioned, so I've been focusing on, on inpatient procedures, but also wanted to highlight outpatient procedures. For, for this, we, we uh, looked at a handful of outpatient procedures and the, the results are on the RAND website and our, our supplemental material. And so if we're just to, to look at all outpatient procedures 
uh, we, we see a pretty wide range across Indiana hospitals. There are far more procedures or more, far more providers in Indiana that treat outpatient services than, than inpatient services. And so potentially there, there are more options to, to design patient steerage programs. If we look at just emergency department visits for, for uh, outpatient EDs, relative prices range from about 175% of Medicare to about 350% of Medicare, and standardized prices range from about $300 to about $800. And if we look at outpatient imaging services, and so this is largely CT scans and, and MRIs, relative prices range from actually under 100% of Medicare to over 750% uh, and almost 800% of Medicare. And standardized prices range from about $300 up to just under $1,000. And one thing to note that becomes, uh, I think, especially relevant on the outpatient procedures is that the, the relative and, and standardized prices aren't exactly the same at the, the procedure level. And so it's important as employers are, are thinking about using this data to think about both measures of prices. So that, that's a lot of information uh, and and I'm, I'm sure that that was a lot uh, and as employers and others have questions, happy to, to answer those. Uh, so, so certainly feel to, to reach out. Or again, uh, the, the data, if you actually want to play around yourself, is on the RAND website. And so what, what do these results mean? And so if you're an employer, that's, that's a lot. And how can you think about actually making use of that data? So I, I think as I kind of think of the, the landscape and how employers have used the, the last round of the RAND study and could potentially use the, uh, the, the future round, the, the synopsis of future rounds, I think there are kind of, uh, there's a continuum with kind of three stops, I think. And so the first is really just to have information about prices. The second is to use this information to think about benchmarking prices and think about network design that, that you can, can uh, uh, steer patients to, to given providers. And then third is just to address prices a little bit more aggressively and to think about the prices that are being negotiated on your behalf. So just to, to, uh, to highlight an example of each, I think one, if one really good uh, uh, piece that the, the Colorado Business Group on Health has, has produced that really leverages the, the data in Colorado is the Colorado Hospital Value Report. And so in Colorado, uh, they, they used the, the RAND study, some internal quality data that, that they've been collecting to really focus on, on the issue of price for, for the members and to think a little bit more collectively about how, as a, an employer group, they, they can design policies to address prices. And so this is something that they really used to just kind of get the ball rolling. I think the kind of the next uh, place on the, this continuum is actually an example from, from Indiana. And so last year when we reported wide variation in prices for, for outpatient procedures, uh, that, that was something that many employers in Indiana uh, thought was a, a potential concern. And so uh, there, there's an uh, article by, by Harris Meyer in Modern Healthcare that really highlights what, what you as an employer coalition and employer group did. And so uh, the, the gist is that 12 uh, of in, you Indiana employers asked uh, a particular third party administrator in Indiana, Anthem, to design a new network that steers patients to lower priced outpatient procedures and is something that you as employers can implement to address the range in prices and to steer patients to lower price and potentially higher value providers. And I, I think the, uh, the final example actually, uh, again, comes, comes from Indiana. So in the report that we presented uh, about 18 months ago, we identified the Parkview Health System in, in Fort Wayne as one of the more expensive providers in, in the country and, and also within the state of Indiana. Now, there are several 
Fort Wayne employers who saw that and were perhaps not that pleased about paying some of the, the highest prices in the country. And so really pushed their, their insurer, in this case also Anthem, to, to, th to be a little bit more aggressive on, on prices. And so uh, here's a, a quote from the Purdue Senior uh, Benefits Leader about how the employers in, in, part, in Fort Wayne really pushed Anthem to, to think more about the prices that, that we reported last year and to hold hospitals and health systems accountable for, for prices. And I think underlying this, this push is a recognition that, that the prices that employers are paying come out of the, the wages that they can pay their workers. And so th those are, I think, three potential options that employers have, or at least three examples, uh, although there are potentially other, uh, a range of other options that employers can implement. And in the report, we actually highlight some of the, the other specific examples about how employers have maybe not used this report, but have thought about other ways to address variation prices. But I also want to uh, acknowledge that there is a, a potential role for state and federal policymakers. And so if you're a, an employer and you have lots of options between different providers, then a lot of the, these potential solutions might be pretty feasible. But I think we need to, to recognize that there are many markets where there just aren't a lot of options for, for employers and other private payers. So there's a recent report by the Healthcare Cost Institute, which is another group that, that looks at a lot of variation prices, that found that in the United States, about 70% of U.S. metropolitan areas are concentrated, if we think about the standard definition to use by the Federal Trade Commission and the Department of Justice. And so if you're an employer in, in one of these, these many uh, concentrated markets, maybe you just don't have a lot of options in, in sending patients to, to different types of providers. And so maybe there's a role for, for state and federal policymakers to address some of the market characteristics that, that uh, lead to high prices. <clears throat> and I, I think employers can also think about some uh, policy uh, options that they could support. Uh, so one is to support an all-payer claims database. So we, uh, for, for the study, went out to individual employers and, and had to get the uh, data from, from the TPA that the employer used. But there are some states, so in our study we used data from six states that have an all-payer claims database where we just have to go to that, that state. And the state APCD in many states does actually a pretty good job of, of monitoring prices and thinking about price growth within the state. Employers might also want to support policies that promote competition, uh, especially within their, their local market community, and also limit gag clauses that exist in many contracts between providers and, and insurers that limit the ability of, of employers to get information on the prices that are negotiated on their behalf. One of the things that's come up recently is, is out-of-network charges and out-of-network bills. And in another RAND report, we have some evidence on how limiting the uh, potential out-of-network bills could actually indirectly lead to reductions in in-network prices and lead to, to less variation in prices. And then uh, finally, I, I mentioned earlier that we did not include data from Maryland because they have an all-payer rate setting program that if, if you're an employer in, in, in Maryland might make your life easier because you don't have to worry about all, all the, the same level of price variation. And so some employers might want to think about those types of options or at least supporting those types of options. So uh, just, just to, to wrap up, in, in uh, my view, the, the rising healthcare costs that we as a, a country have collectively experienced over the last uh, decades places a lot of pressures on, on, on worker wages and the, the flexibility that employers have to, to compensate their, their workers. I think this is something that is especially important to monitor and to have good data on during the COVID pandemic, as many employers have pretty strong financial headwinds. One way to look at the wide variation in prices that we, we have is that this is a potential problem, but maybe the, the more optimistic view is that if you're an employer, this is a, a potential savings opportunity. And so just given the, the amount of money that employers spend on healthcare, if you're able to shift 
patients from higher price to lower price providers, that could represent a pretty tremendous savings for free. And it could be something that, that can free up, free up lots of resources within your organization. And then for just two uh, kind of uh, uh, additional points, I really think as we've been uh, building this, this study and working a lot with, with employers is that they really need to be pretty aggressive on demanding transparency about the information that they and their employees are paying and have really been negotiated on their behalf. And so the, the way that employers purchase anything else in their organization is a lot different than how they purchase healthcare. And I, I think employers need to, to really think about using that, that same mindset for healthcare, just because it really is, for, for many employers, their second largest source of spending. And then also, I think that employers here have a lot of room to use transparency to inform the benefit strategy and think about smart ways to, to reduce spending. So uh, thank you again, uh, I'm happy to, to answer any questions. And also just to say that this has been a, a great opportunity to, to look at data from, from many employers and to think about the, the market that you're facing. Thank you. Great, thank you, Chris, um, for that presentation. Um, I know Chris is joining us live and, and um, there he is from California. Hopefully no rolling blackouts today for you. Um, we have had quite a few questions come in. I would invite everyone who is online to submit questions. We'll get through as many as we can. But I know I was trying to, um, I know you were answering questions for many folks as, as they were submitting them, but a couple stuck out to me and I wanted to see if you could provide some comments for us. Um, one question that a couple people asked, and, and maybe I think would be a good clarification point um, for our audiences, can you clarify uh, professional fees, um, help our audience understand the difference between professional and facility fees as it relates to the study? Sure, that, that's a really good question. So when you go to the hospital, we, we have the system where uh, you, you get uh, services from the, the hospital as a facility and receive a, a bill which accounts for the, the lion's share of the total cost from the hospital itself. But if you go to a hospital, you're really there to, to see a doctor and to, to get care. And so there's actually a separate bill, which is called the professional fee that covers the services for the doctors or the, the other healthcare professionals. And so what we did in this study is we actually took the two of those and instead of keeping them separate, as is done a lot of times, we combine them into, into a single price because when you go to the hospital as a patient, what you really care about is what's the, the total price going to be, not necessarily what's the, what are the different components. Very good. Um, one question that came in um, talked a, a, about a glitch in the system. So is there a glitch where we're always talk, talking about price, but we don't seem to be able to discuss the actual cost of the service? Do you have any comments around that question? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Um, it would be, you know, when we think about spending, it's, as Gloria mentioned earlier, really price time, times quantity. And there's been lots of other, other work showing that actually quantity uh, doesn't necessarily vary that much uh, across systems. Uh, but what we really don't have a good handle on is price. And so I think as we're, as we're thinking about measuring total costs, it's important to think about utilization rates, but we can't measure total cost or total value without looking directly at prices. Very good. Um, another question came in that I thought would be interesting for you to comment on um, for our audience. Um, in other countries, employers have no role in health insurance. Isn't the problem that the U.S. has two or more health insurance systems that insurance companies and health systems use to play off each other? Um, employers and their health benefits managers are never going to have the skill sets to win and employers and their family, excuse me, employees and their families may suffer the final consequences. So this, this individual is wanting you to comment on, on that. That's a, uh, I think a, a, a huge and important question. 
And the the employer's role in the healthcare system has really evolved over the last couple of decades. And it's something that uh, kind of, through, as, as we mentioned in the report, kind of through this accent of history, employers now play one of the most important roles in healthcare in the United States. Many employers, if they're uh, you know thinking about building a business or thinking about uh, what are my products going to look like, what are my my customers, and not necessarily how am I going to operate as, as essentially a health insurance company. And so there, there are certainly is, is questions of how how much do employers actually want to be continue to be involved in the, in the healthcare industry, and I, I think that's a, a much broader question that we we need to have a kind of honest conversation about uh, from the, the employer's perspective. And what are the the different policy options to to maybe think about lessening the, the employer's role in the healthcare industry? Very good. We've had a lot of people ask questions about the data. So a couple of things. One, can you help us understand, um, you mentioned there's a data supplement and Excel file that can be downloaded. What type of information is available in that file that um, our, our attendees can look at? And then are there any kind of quick high level data points that you could share with individuals that are on um, that might be interesting from the study? Yeah, so the, the supplemental material, which is, is downloadable from the RAND website, and I believe, I believe also the EFI website, really contains the, the detailed information about the prices that we found for each specific hospital and, and health system, and also a lot of the underlying data points that are presented in terms of costs for, for different types of services at the hospital level. It also includes uh, some information on, on the sample size for each hospital, so you can get a sense of kind of how, how representative maybe our, our results for, or for a given hospital or, or health system, and also data points by, by state. In terms of the, the high level points, I, I think maybe the easiest thing to do is to, to just look at the, the slides that we, we have here, which contain a lot of the, the high level numbers, or actually even look at the report where we tried to highlight some of the, the top level findings. And can you clarify, there is data from independent hospitals in there. It's not just hospital systems, correct? That, that's exactly right. So we, we have data both from hospitals that are part of a health system and hospitals that are not part of a health system and are independent. In those, we, we denote as independent hospitals. Um, we have one person asking, um, does the study normalize the Medicare rate or is it a national average? Medicare rates are not the same across the country. That's a really good question. And so what we did in the study is we looked at how much Medicare would have paid for the exact same service at that exact same hospital. And so uh, the, the, the question is right that the Medicare pays different hospitals, different amounts based on kind of the, the characters of that hospital, and then also where that hospital is located. And so in our, our prices relative to Medicare, we try to account for all of those differences and get a, uh, a number that's representative of exactly how much Medicare would have paid that hospital. Very good. Um, and for those of, um, that are commenting, we'll post a link to both the RAND study as well as the, um, the Excel download that Chris just talked about momentarily. Um, I'm not sure how, many, how much time we have for more questions. We still have um, quite a few coming in. Probably um, for one more question. Great. Thank you, Gloria. Um, Let's see here, trying to find one that maybe we haven't answered yet. Uh -huh. While you're thinking about that, I'm gonna ask Chris a question. I know you're scanning the box. So Chris, uh, just as you know, in regards to your prior question, when you were talking about prices relative to Medicare and how Medicare pays every hospital differently, depending on their wages, depending on the disproportionate share, medical education. But can you comment on how that's different than standardized prices? Because we're looking at it both ways. That, that, that's right. And so the, the prices relative to Medicare really look at accounting for all the differences in the Medicare system, how much are employers paying relative to Medicare. And as I mentioned in the slide, some employers may say, look, uh, we, we don't necessarily care if a given hospital gets paid more because of dish payments or, or teaching adjustments and so on. And so we calculated what we call the, the standardized prices, which just does the, the patient case mix adjustment and doesn't calculate prices relative to Medicare. Super. Kristen, you have one question? Yes, one more. Um, we're wondering about 
um, a couple of folks have posted, some of the hospitals may have um, small numbers of services captured. Why is that? And then in addition to that, does the data distinguish between in-network and out-of-network claims? Yeah, so for the, uh, the second question, we, we combined in and out of network claims. And so we, we think this is actually from the employer's perspective, a, a good thing to do because it represents what's the actual cost of, of going to a given facility. Uh, and then for the first question, we, we did, uh, you know, our, our sample, uh, one potential limitation of the study is that we, we do have somewhat of a convenient sample in terms of the employers that participated. And so there's some hospitals where we, we didn't have as, as much data as, as other hospitals. We did do some cutoffs to make sure that we had a, a, a good sample for each facility and actually dropped quite a few hospitals where we just didn't have enough data. Um, but I think another point to, to, to think about is for the participating employers who contributed data, the prices for those individual hospitals that report represent 100% of the claims for that and the spending for, for those employers. Great. Well, thank you, Chris. I think we're out of time today.